Good morning. And I also say good afternoon and good evening wherever you are in the world. It's afternoon where I am and it's good morning where you gentlemen are. So I'll be more specific and say good morning, Mohammed. Good morning, Phoebe. Good morning, Graham. Good morning, Phoebe. Good <laughs> more morning, Graham and Mohammed. Thank you. Always, always good to do this. By the way, what are we doing? In, we're, we're, we're greeting each other. We're smiling and... This is about relationships. I'm I'm just going to make this point about leaders should be doing this every day they meet the people that they're leading, shouldn't they? Yes, of course, of course. And so often they don't. They just I'm too I'm too important. Uh, <laughs> I don't need to say good morning to you. Yes, you do. Okay, I've had my little piece, which was a little bit off track, but I think it's important. So what we want to talk about today is culture and leadership. And Phoebe started this and said, we should talk about the important area of culture and leadership. So lead us into this, Phoebe. Give us your parameters, your overview of that topic that you want us to discuss today, culture and leadership. Yeah, so uh, as we started with the greeting process, I remembered my days in, in in one of my organization in which we have to we have to take the lift every day morning you know so every day morning the staff members are in queue everyone is serious and we enter the lift everyone say good morning then they, everyone is very <laughs> suited and muted and then uh, very serious in the lift and someone said why everyone is very serious in the lift yeah. that, that made a, a moment of laughter in that space and then chit chat started you know between people so you know that is an example of how you can flourish culture when we create that dialogue so i thought in many workplaces that is missing and it can be something which liberates people to create more and innovative conversations which which makes people being heard seen and respected so with that thought process, I, I thought, okay, culture can shape what we do. And especially as, uh, as, as leadership is everyone's business, we all impact it. But, you know, in organizations, we, because of positional and hierarchy, sometimes the so-called positional leaders have a bit more say in the culture. So that is why I thought, let us have this conversation on culture. I'm going to borrow a statement and inject that here. Remember this as we go through this, this uh, today. Culture beats strategy every time. In fact, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Muhammad, tell me your views on culture and the importance of culture. Well, um, uh... From the greeting itself, it was a very good uh, topic, and I'm glad that um, Phoebe has highlighted it. And I want to try this in the elevator, but I need some courage. <laughs> <laughs> However, before we start, you asked me, Graham, uh, you greeted me for Ramadan, both of you, and you, you we spoke a little about some of the uh, elements of Ramadan that uh, shape my behavior uh, as a Muslim, and we talked about what Ramadan actually means uh, in terms of do's and don'ts, and what people expand it to beyond the do's and don'ts, they, how, how they uh, celebrate, how they act in Ramadan. So these are not the specific uh, requirements of Ramadan, but they actually go beyond that because it's the culture. This is how they interact with people during Ramadan. This is how they do travel, work, etc. So uh, culture is, uh, you know, uh, it's there everywhere. Uh, and it, sometimes people don't have to define it because they already live it fully. And what so, um, what you're talking yeah. about, about culture specifically in regard to Ramadan, I know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, because I'm always happy to be corrected when I make comments of this nature, but I'm aware that, that there is a difference in right during Ramadan, cultural difference in Bahrain, in Saudi, in UAE, in Oman, different ways 
which is still absolutely aligned to what's required during uh, uh, in the uh, holy months, uh, but yeah. it is it is more cultural in the way that people of those different countries celebrate the holy month of Ramadan. Am I right? It's absolutely right, and the same goes with organizations. Place, <laughs> time, yeah, place, time, and people, and nature of work, and what what we what we uh, uh, what is our vision? What's our aim? All of that makes difference. Although all of them might be doing uh, like uh, factories, maybe they are all factories, but uh, the time and place and people will have different meanings to different people. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and I'm going to suggest, based on what you've both already said, that there there are times when we or us as an individual go into an organisation, and we can sense the different culture. Would you agree with that? It's something, Absolutely, yeah. It's something that we feel, uh, those of us who are kind of doing what we do, we get an understanding of differences in the way people work subtly. You, you with me? And now, let's just say as a starting point for this, a kind of a starting point, that this starts from the top, doesn't it? The culture yeah. is, is uh, formed, it is, it is developed, it is cultivated um, at the top and it cascades down. Would you agree with that? Yeah, you, you, again, this is something which I, uh, I, I want to bring at this point, you know. We, we as employees in organization, look what my uh, senior members are doing, what they are, what they are encouraging, what they are discouraging. And, you know, it is like, as you mentioned, when you, when, when you mentioned culture starts at the top, sometimes the, we, we are seeing them as in a stage, as in a stage, elevated stage, where we are keenly watching uh, each and every moment, whether they are smiling, whether they are serious, whether they are uh, welcoming, what, 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 what expression is there? And based on that, assumptions get created. Yeah. Sometimes we have the courage to check that. Sometimes we don't have the courage to check that. Yeah. And as I say, leaders at every level, leaders, you are being watched, right? So be, be careful what people are watching and, and, and seeing from you. And that starts, as you've just said, at the top. So we are seeing the behaviours of those people at the top. Mohammed, what's your response to this? I actually... Um... I have lived through this in my 17 years in corporate. Um, and I saw that when leaders decide to make a huge change in the organization, they start changing the language officially. Uh, formally, they release um, new charters, new uh, ways of doing things, and they spread, they train. But guess what? At the end of the day, I agree with my friend Phoebe that people are, okay, watching you. In other words, maybe you release a five uh, element or seven or 10 element culture, our new culture, all right? But then at the end of the day, they are watching the management and leaders. How do they really act beyond that piece of paper? Uh, they are looking for interpretation in the way people behave. For example, if the CEO says um, safety is first and there will be no compromise on safety, okay? And then you well, you think, okay, to what degree does he mean that? Then you start watching him and how, what they do. If they turn a bl blind eye, actually, on uh, uh, misbehaviors or mal practices in safety, then you say, okay, we now know to what degree that piece yeah. of sentence means. So leaders will shape uh, what culture means based on what we see they do. Yeah, it is really very much about what they do. We are watching them. We, 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 we're seeing what their behaviours are. Now, what also goes through, is, goes through my mind is in terms of organisations and the way they operate, there are things called policies. So we have a new policy. So how often is that going to change behaviour? How, how effective is a policy document going to be in changing the culture? 
see, because I've been most of my time in safety, um, it gets a bit tricky, you know? When the rewarding, the behaviors rewarded uh, are rewarded in the, in the line of the policy, then you know that they are serious about this policy, that this policy is not only ink on paper, but actually it is uh, living uh, among us. But if uh, our behaviors are uh, rewarded in a way that the policy doesn't matter, you know, that was only released and written, at the end of the day, um, we can go ahead doing what we used to do. And so then you know the policy has little weakness. So it depends at the end of the day how you reward uh, the actions. Uh, there, This is where the power of policy comes. The next day, if, if you are violating something and you got a fine or you got stopped and penalized, the next day you, you come across that piece of policy, it's gonna, you're going to say, yes, sir, no longer. So there is the power of policy. Yeah, look, I think it's, it's a kind of um, an excuse in some respects. It's a, it's a backup. But when the behavior is, is lived by the, by the leaders, then the change will occur. But simply sending out an email with the 10 points of the revised policy, please read this now and make changes in your behaviour and make changes to the culture. How effective is that going to be? Not very effective at all, right? People in many cases are not even going to read the new policy document uh, until, as you said, there's an issue and then, oh, they didn't read the policy. Oh, okay. But the point of Phoebe's... Um, suggestion of what we talk about today is so valid and that is that culture and leadership absolutely go together not le not culture and and policy not culture and directives not culture and you know he's, well here's another example it's like companies stating very clearly that we are a family organization yeah okay do they treat their staff really treat their staff as family we care about our customers. Yeah, right. Do you really care about your customers? Do you live that? No, this is, these are so often statements that are, that are put out there in an organisational or, or a PR sense, but they're not lived. And it's the same as the leadership in organisations. Like, this is what we should be doing, but they're not living that. So let's drill this culture aspect and leadership down even further. Phoebe, take us there. Yeah, <laughs> this, this, I, I was just thinking some <laughs> some some interesting thoughts came to my mind. One was, you know, each and every employee when they start their uh, work life as a new employee or otherwise, you have an onboarding session in which we have, like being a facilitator quite often, we will be standing in front and highlighting these are the core values of organization and what these core values means and how it is being uh, practiced. Now, onboarding happens very well. Then people go back to the work and there the interaction starts with other members and, and the member who has recently joined observes keenly what way the values are being practiced and if the values are <laughs> kept away and things are done differently that becomes the culture so the yes. what we what we what we promote on one side and what we practice on another side will be entirely different and sometimes this 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 also impact uh, you know the level of stress which for employees because there is a huge dissonance with respect to what is said and what is being done. So, yeah, so it is very crucial from an organization as well as individual leader perspective. So, so let me, before I come to you, Mohammed, let me make this point from what you're saying. Every organization, even every group of people, right, there is a culture, we, should, we could say, in that, yeah. in that grouping of people. So there is a culture. But the culture is not always a good culture, right? It's not always the best that they can have in order to get the results that are, that are important. Mohammed, how are you feeling about this? 
Uh, absolutely. Um, it's at the end of the day, you uh, come into a place, maybe you join recently a department, and you have been given the instructions, induction, guidance on what's right and what's wrong. And then you start to behave uh, as per your rules of recruitment. And then, but the group there aren't doing that. And you feel like you are isolated. And then when you start to behave according to uh, the rules, somebody comes to you and says, nah, it's okay. They won't notice. You can have lunch anytime. <laughs> for example, all right? Uh, so, and then the peer pressure comes here. And the peer pressure is another word for the culture around here, uh, Graham. So uh, this is really important that how things are done here will affect whatever, wherever we are going. And it might be not the place we want to go, but it's there. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, when you're talking about the briefing that's given by HR, the, the onboarding of the new new staff, I say to managers, do you have a conversation with new team members about what your expectations are of how they will be performing for you? What do, you, you, do they clearly know what you expect from them? And the t- number of times that the managers will say to me, no, that's HR's job. No, it's not. HR has a function that's very important, of course, uh, and much of that is around annual leave and those sort of basic things. And I don't want to diminish what HR are doing because I say that HR is the most important organiza- department in the organisation. But it is the manager, therefore the leader, who establishes the culture for his or her team and what the expectations are for people who are working in that team and what he will give to them as a leader and the sort of things that he does that we're going to come to in a moment in regard to the leadership challenge. And that then goes beyond that team. And I talk often about creating a team of choice, and that's a team that's created because of the culture that's created there. And others say, Mm -hmm. what's going on over there? They're doing amazing things. What's happening? I want to be in that team. And when you build and extend that, it becomes a company of choice. You know, you don't you start a company of choice by doing it top down. You start with teams and then, it, and, and then spread that out. That's how you then create a company of choice. This is about the culture, starting with the team, starting with the way the leader is performing and behaving with the people and the, and what he's shown. We talked about values, Phoebe talked about the, what, what and, and you mentioned that before, Muhammad, about what a leader should be doing that others are observing from, from what they're doing and what, the way they are demonstrating those values. Muhammad. Yeah. Um, see, it brings my mind to this question, which is critical. Now, uh, our talk is always on leaders, okay? So, uh, we are supposed to give leaders um, guidance to uh, to do their job correctly and better and easier. But then they will say, okay, now even the culture is on my shoulder. This is too much. So my question here is, and I put it to everyone, as a leader, I might demonstrate the behaviors I want to see, which are they are stipulated in the policy, for example. I might go and uh, drive around the campus or the vicinity with my seat belts on. Okay, Le- look, everyone, I am uh, practicing safety. But the behaviors that we want to see outside are way beyond and above uh, that the ones that the leaders must show. In other words, I can't just come in the- everywhere and do things so that you watch me, and not everybody watches me every day. So what can a leader do to spread the culture across all sorts of behaviors, including that uh, technician who is working on a piece in his workshop? So the leader cannot demonstrate that specific behavior, and yet he wants to spread the culture of the right things to be done. So how can a a leader uh, reinforce or help in that regard? I'm going to save my response. I've got to, I think I can give you some very helpful response to that. Phoebe, what's your, what's your answer to this? Yeah, well, again, I think uh, we, we, we touched upon a couple of things. One is, you know, like uh, mo- modeling that value behaviors, which you want to 
cultivate in that space and mm. and it is simple but it, and again this discouraging that values which you see one example i i, I relate to uh, one of my cousin was having a conversation this weekend and he was saying that he is working in a manufacturing facility and he was saying that you know um, there are people who don't give any any, any uh, attention to creating the safety in that space they are working with uh, heavy metal uh, products and he was saying he is hesitant to say that to his line manager because uh, he, he don't know whether that is being encouraged or whether he will be taken out of the workplace because of being highlighting that so you know how how can as a leader listen to people so that people can come to them so that these values are uh, observed or practiced so that is my first thought process how, and modeling that and as i started you know how can i be heard how can i be seen how can i be respected in that space make it more receptive culture i will say good culture and as a leader i have to say that this is what good work look like for me in the beginning itself i will reward this good work if i am seeing bad work i will i, I will not encourage that i will discourage that yes. this will not be rewarded this will be seen as a way of uh, you know object which i just don't want to be in this place so that can be uh, my thought process over to you graham okay i'm going to start with one of the uh, fundamentals of leadership that we talk about in the leadership challenge and this goes right back to our very opening words to each other on this call where i said hi good morning good afternoon how where are you right this is about the relationship leadership is a relationship and if i walk into my office and don't don't acknowledge other people. This is not a good thing, right? I know, for instance, here's a, a, a an example of the Middle East. Sometimes there are some larger organisations where the the uh, in the high rise buildings where they are operating, the managing director, CEO, the top man, has his own elevator to his office. <laughs> And I am aware of one situation where the senior person was away for a day or two, maybe two days, and someone used the elevator and that person was found out and was dismissed because he used that person's elevator. It's reserved for him exclusively. So my, my, <laughs> I'm saying, why is this? Because he, Is it because he's in a hurry to get to his office that he needs to be using the exclusive elevator to get up to level 30, whatever it is, or more. But what is he missing out on? He's missing out on the critical element of interacting with his staff because he's got to go in that elevator that takes him up there. Senior people must interact with their staff. Good morning. How are you? All of those sorts of things. This then builds the relationship, and that then extends out beyond just good morning, how are you, because the leader, at whatever level, then is going to be showing interest in that other person, is going to be recognising the good things that they do, is going to be challenging them, challenge the process, is going to be enabling them. Oh, what am I talking about? The five practices of exemplary leadership. And this then establishes the culture. The, not it, This is not because I've said that every organisation, every small group of people is going to have a culture, but this is going to establish a culture where people want to be there. They want to come to work every day. They want to perform at their best. They want to be innovative. They want to be productive. They want to climb the mountain with the leader. And this is started with a team leader or whatever, but it's the person who builds the relationship and that's a caring relationship. It's a relationship that recognises if someone's not well, they're going to say, is there something we can do to help you? It's a relationship where if, if that person is, is of the Muslim faith and the country that we're in doesn't have predominantly recognise that, we're going to be showing some respect and some caring for what they're doing during Ramadan. And this builds a relationship. And so we have a culture created where people want to be there because they are respected and looked after and valued. Not going up in your own elevator, not avoiding talking to staff, not just telling them what to do. Beautiful. Uh, I wanted. I, I was waiting for something like this, 
uh, because that part uh, uh, of what you narrated to us is also key in spreading culture. It might help the leaders in spreading the culture without them having to be daily basis in every department. At one point in our company, uh, we were trying to raise the level of uh, reporting for near miss incidents, not incidents only, but near misses. And people are not encouraged to do that because at the end of the day, you will report something that's wrong within uh, you or an act you have done wrong, although it didn't lead to an injury. So what did we do there? We decided to uh, adopt a policy. Uh, actually, it was a behavior by the management to reward people for uh, reporting near misses. And suddenly, uh, one good near miss was so uh, important that it helped us uh, manage the incident and before it happens. So what did we do? We went publicly, we took a photo with that guy and we gave him a gift by the management and it was spread across all the Outlook emails for all departments. So people started talking. Yeah, look, they are rewarding now. Uh, they were rewarding us for giving early warnings of my, what might go wrong. Let's report. What is this near miss? Let's report it. So I want to say that we can use the power of gossip. <laughs> yes, you heard me right. Yeah. Gossip. Yeah. I don't want to say story. I say gossip. People are gossiping anyway between themselves across lunch every day. They are telling what happens in the departments and, and by the managers, yeah. by the leaders. Yes. in their own story narration. What if we use this power of gossip, which is already happening in the organization, and create a story that cannot be narrated wrongly? They will spread the story. So I want to say that the power of stories is very important for spreading the culture, even when you are not there every day and every time. Mohammed, let's just drill this down more specifically. I know what a great storyteller you are and how important you regard the value of stories. And I, we've talked about this before. I know the impact of stories, and I really think that organisations should develop a, a learning where leaders use stories. And when leaders use stories tell about these good things and talk about the culture, that is cascaded down to others who within the organisation will use those stories to spread spread the word, to talk about the good things that are happening in the organisation and to be specific in their, in, their, uh, in their discussion. It's a story. It's not just simply gossip. It's not, and I'm not being negative about, but all about what you're saying, but sometimes, let's just say there are two people from two different branches of the organisation who meet for coffee, and one of them says, oh, my gosh, my boss, he's driving me crazy. Oh, I've got this and I've got this. And the other one says, really? My boss does this. Now, they're not necessarily stories, but that is a direct indication of the culture of those two areas. And what happens is the one is saying, oh, my boss, he's terrible, wants to move to the other one because of the culture that exists in that other branch. Culture. I mean, look at your story. Your story, sorry to cut you in, but the story about the elevator, you are telling it after so many years, and it's so vivid to us. And I'm imagining that when the news came about suspending that person, how it was received within the organization. Yeah. Suspending. He was dismissed. I mean, this is, this is just how egregious is that? Not at all on the on the scale of one to ten. It doesn't exist that he used the elevator when that person, the senior person, was away. I'll teach you. Don't use my elevator. Oh my gosh, he should be sharing his elevator. Come with me, and we'll talk up the way up, and we'll talk about how we can grow the company. We'll talk about the. I'll get your ideas about what we can do differently when we share my elevator. Won't you like that? Yes, I will like the ride up in your elevator because it's got some soft carpet on the floor. <laughs> and we're going to talk. <laughs> and also they can apply Phoebe's trick. The leader in the elevator can tell people, hey, why are we so serious in the elevator? And everybody bursts. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. And then the next thing you know, each one leaves the elevator to his section and department and guess what they will talk about on coffee. 
Yes, sorry. Power of the the copy. What are they going to do when they walk out of the elevator? What are they going to be doing? Smiling. <laughs> Immediately, right? As they walk and yeah. they what you've just suggested. Right. Bibi. No, no you know, yeah, yeah it, it, it creates that smiling culture, you know, within the workplace where no, no. each of us are entering no that. Uh... No smile. <laughs> it's a serious work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why? Why? And, and sorry. No, yeah. Listen to us. We are talking about uh, big organizations. Uh, whatever we talk about, looks like we are talking about big organizations. But come to now, the myriad numbers of startups, entrepreneurs, small units, uh, one building co corporation, and imagine how fast you can spread the culture and make the productivity yeah, shoot up, okay, by just doing that small act. And it will, it's very contagious. Culture is contagious. We don't wait to have 5,000 staff before we create culture. Culture is going to start when there's five people working together or three people. The seeds of culture are going to be there at that point, right? And that's what's important. It's going to grow from, from that. So all leaders have an opportunity to influence culture. So, yeah. yeah, we've had a lively discussion today. I hope that you have enjoyed the discussion, Phoebe and Mohammed. I have. And I hope that those who are listening to us enjoy this discussion. And I'm going to be putting up my, my email address, and I would love to hear from people who've got some comments about what we talk about on this leadership channel, leadership channel challenge, Middle East. Gentlemen, Thank you very much. I wish you the best of today, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Yeah, thank you so much, Phoebe, Graham, and everyone who's listening to us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Muhammad. And I want to highlight subscribe. Yes, subscribe. Come with us on this journey. We've got a lot of learning to do. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you all next week.